All right, hey folks. So today's topic is the basics of periodization. And what I want to discuss today is firstly, where did periodization, periodization come from? And also why you and when you might need it. So firstly, thanks for making it onto my channel. If you have any questions or comments about today's video, pop them down below. And if you'd like to work with me, there is a link in the description. So uh, let's crack on with the video. Firstly, early periodization. Now, this information I got from um, Bill Starr's classic book, Only the Strongest Shall Survive. And it was um, a great piece of work um, that he wrote back in the 60s. And he noted that early periodization actually came about when coaches noticed the differences in the seasons. So they noticed that training was more productive in the winter months and it was less productive in the summer months. So it's quite interesting. Uh, they really had no idea about training anything other than that. They just saw these uh, differences in their athletes between the summer months relative to the winter months. So what they started to do was, and this, these, this was, I think was runners or Olympic lifters, something like that. So what they started to do was they started to organize training to be heavier with more workload in the winter months and to be lighter with more restorative work and perhaps more peaking work in the summer months prior to you know the Olympics and stuff like that. So that was the early periodization. That's kind of where it started. And now from that, we have the massive array of periodization and what we know about the human body. And uh, you can sort of break things down into further detail. Well, that was kind of where it started. Now, in my sort of definition of periodization is this, it's the organization of training to produce results on a weekly, monthly, or yearly time frame, And uh, I have all three measures in because it really depends on your level of advancement. And as a beginner, for example, isn't really thinking of a yearly time frame, doesn't need to. Whereas somebody who's advanced needs to think of all three. They need to think of what they're doing on a weekly schedule, on a monthly schedule, and on a yearly schedule. And uh, generally we use these terms. So a microcycle, is considered to be your training in terms of weeks. So for example, if you did a push pull legs across the entire week, that's your micro cycle. Or let's say you did a push pull legs across five days. Well, in that case, five days would be your micro cycle rather than seven days. You get what I'm saying? Most people pick seven days because it's related to the calendar, but in general, a micro cycle is one rotation of your work. Next up is mesocycles. They tend to last multiple rotations. Now, for ease of communication, and for most people, tend to use months. But the reality is it's just number of rotations. So let's say you're on a five-day split, and you run the five-day split six times, then your mesocycle will be 30 days, and whatever else if you're deloading. And macro cycles are then measured in multiple mesocycles, so it's across the year. This is just terminology that you may have heard, and if you were curious about what it meant, this is what it means. So moving on. Now, the typical sort of periodization you would have firstly been exposed to is linear periodization. If you are a bodybuilder or aspiring bodybuilder, or let's say you're from a different field of work altogether and you've just read a few articles about how to do things, this is typically what people say. You know, you've heard about progressive overload, you know, that's the secret to life uh, as we know it. Progressive overload is essentially linear periodization. It is this, the idea that you add weight whenever you can and you hit the top of the rep range, then you add more weight hit the top of the rep range, add more weight. It's basically just simple bodybuilder style training. You have a routine and you just get stronger week to week. So that's probably the first that most people will be exposed to. It certainly was the first thing I was exposed to. Um, so back in the day, I had a very abbreviated routine when I first stepped foot in a hardcore gym. And uh, it was one day I would do a squat, partial deadlift and calves. And the next day, next day I would do um, overhead press, chins and dips. And I would just rotate those two days, probably training about three times a week. Just did that for months and it worked really well. I mean, it got me from beginner stage to right up to intermediate because I was getting stronger like clockwork every time because I would do a session and the stimulus from that session would be enough to fuel my next session and I would get stronger and then I could get stronger the next session. I would just keep on going. It was great. You know, I just carried on getting stronger for like nine months or whatever it was. So that was linear periodization and possibly the best results that I got reflected the fact that I was a beginner and uh, linear periodization worked really well for beginners because you're just not creating so much of a stress. You're not advanced enough that you need more variety. 
So that's linear periodization. So it's kind of like um, push for legs with one rotation is linear. Um, adding weight when you hit your top range is linear. Not doing any deloads or like relying on like life deloads. <laughs> that's a popular thing in bodybuilding circles. Like I don't deload, I rely on like life deloading me. Like, okay, mate. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's basically linear periodization. Okay. Now, why is this popular in bodybuilding circles? It's popular because this is what I think. I think it's easy to communicate and market. Like if you have a forum with, I don't know, thousands of people, it's very easy to put up the latest upper lower or push pull legs routine and talk about how this particular exercise hits the glutes in this particular manner, how this particular pull down hits the lower lats or the upper lats or God knows what else. It's easy to communicate. When the reality is you're just switching around if you exercise every now and again, you're calling it with a different name, right? But it's still just linear periodization, bodybuilding, very basic stuff, right? So it's easy to market that because you don't need a great deal of complexity. So these videos, they don't tend to get very many views because they're a bit more complicated. So I'm, hopefully you guys who appreciate this information will get a bit more from this as I delve into it further. So I think it's, um, it's popular because they're easy to communicate and market. Secondly, they work for beginners and typically the type of people who are looking for information online tend to be either beginners or like your late stage intermediates who are now stuck and they need to know what else to do. So it's easy to communicate. Also, it tends to work well with things like dirty bulks, like the classic GOMAD, because one way to increase the weight on the bar is just force feed. We we had a phrase when I was younger and that was, uh, if it was in powerlifting circles and it was gluttony is the last refuge of the week. <laughs> so if, if you didn't gain any strength at 180 pounds, just go up to 190 and odds are just due to leverages, you'd gain more strength. So it's used in that sense. I always felt though, that if you had to force your body weight up to see more gains, your programming wasn't up to scratch. That's what I always felt like you should be able to. And as you guys know, I'm a believer in recomposition. Recomposition also comes with a robust training stimulus, which provides the stimulus for growth in such a strong way that you don't necessarily need a deficit, assuming your body fat is, you know, reasonable and not super low. And also what else is really popular in bodybuilding circles? Well, drugs, you know, the thing about drugs is, um, one side effect that they do have as well as growing a lot of muscle is they make you stupid because Let's say you hit, like I did in 2002, 2001, I hit late intermediate, late beginner stage, intermediate stage, and I hit a plateau and I needed more periodization. Well, if I had just taken a bunch of drugs, that 90 kilo bench plateau, I would have passed it. It wouldn't be 90 kilos. It would have been 95 the next week, then 100 the next week, then 105. If I had just ate so much food and taken so many drugs, then I wouldn't need to know all this stuff that I know now and that what eventually got me to a... 140 bench and a 180 bench. I wouldn't need to know that stuff because who gives a crap, right? So, because you just take more drugs. So uh, that's why I don't want to touch too heavily on the drug subject, but I think it's important to note that one of the reasons why linear periodization is so popular in bodybuilding circles and bodybuilders typically focus on such minutia of detail, like exercise angles and all that kind of stuff that it's simply because the, mostly the, the solutions that get tossed around in bodybuilding circles are more drugs. So yeah, my own example was like when I hit them by plateau of about a 90 kilo bench, 140 squat and I don't know, 190 deadlift, I just hit a stone wall. There was nothing I could do that I wasn't already doing. I had to learn about periodization. And I gave you guys the example many times that I contacted Dan John and he taught me about deloads weeks and all that kind of stuff. And I started off on my road to getting a lot stronger. That was, that was how I found out about it. I found out about it through necessity. I had to stop doing linear periodization because quite simply it stopped working. So in terms of the limitations of linear periodization, at a certain point, more complexity is required. Now, when does that happen? That tends to vary for different people. So you'll, you could get a guy who's benching 140 kilos and he's still like, I don't know, why do you, why complicate things, bro? I'm like, I don't want to complicate things. <laughs> do you think when I was hitting my head against the wall with a 90 kilo bench for like years, do you think I wanted to complicate things? I didn't want to complicate things. I wanted a 140 kilo bench. I didn't care how I got it. Um, I just wanted a big bench. I wanted a big squat. I wanted a big deadlift. It didn't matter to me whether it was linear. I, I had no, you know, um, romantic ideal idealism of uh, linear periodization. I didn't care. 
all I wanted was a solution. So when is it should be done by necessity and for some people it could be a 90 kilo bench for some people it could be 120 for some people it could be 140. you will literally get guys at the gym very very genetically elite guys who will go right up to 140 kilo bench and go lol noobs why are you writing down your workouts just eat train heavy like why didn't i think of that <laughs> you know can you relate to what i'm saying right um at a certain point more complexity is required you know and you get, I get that in the comments as well. Uh, I had a comment the other day about, yeah, I keep my work in a six to 10 rep range. Like, cool. Like, I'm glad you can do that. Like for many of us, even getting to that point requires far more complexity. Not, we don't do it because we want to, we do it because we have to. And it varies between different people just based on where you stall, you know? It, there's not much else to it, really. there's no rhyme and reason behind it. And it doesn't really even tell you a great deal about your genetic potential. Like there was a guy, uh, Bob Bernarski, back in the 60s, he was an American um, weightlifter for the American team. And he basically went from the beginning of his career right to the end of his career on the same routine. Just did the same thing week in, week out, added weight to the bar, got stronger. That's it. Literally all he had to do. Didn't have to periodize, didn't have to do anything. He trained with the American weightlifting team, but not quite with them. He would just do his own routine and he just never, just carried on doing the same stuff day in, day out, week in, week out, just getting stronger and stronger and stronger until he was a world beater. Some people need more variation. Uh, some people are just built to lift in a certain way. You know, there's no rhyme and reason. All I know is that if once you hit that wall and you don't employ more complicated measures, then you won't progress any further. That's all I know. All right. So the question is what happens next? So at that point, when you have hit a stall, you've got a couple of options. And essentially, what you've got to look at is how long can I go for before I start to burn out and something goes wrong? So typically, you'll find that once you get to a certain level of advancement, you can work for a certain number of weeks before you need a change. And usually, that's not really that long. Like you might go for three, four, five, six weeks before you start to get little twinges here and there and progress starts to grind to a halt. That's typically your cue for when you need to either deload or change stimulus change exercises okay so you've got a range of options there firstly you could deload and then carry on with the same routine after the deload secondly you could completely change the routine like for example have the same basic structure but make small changes in exercises repetition ranges and then go from there now either way works fine they both serve the same purpose and they have their advantages and their disadvantages so an advantage of the deloads, advantage of the deloads is that you can, you get a very quick um, payback in terms of knowing whether you've improved or not, whether you are improving or not, because you're essentially doing the same routine again. With the change of step, with the change of exercises, you have to kind of run back to this same exercise, maybe weeks later, a month later, to see whether you've improved or not. So, I generally prefer deloads, but I have been known to do um, more of a conjugate style as well. Um, I'll just say on that point that there's plenty in block periodization where you can employ conjugate rules as well. Uh, but what I'm talking about here is specifically whether you do a deload and carry on the same block or whether you have another block which is a different set of exercises or not. Now, another thing that you need in terms of uh, training is a variety of stimulus. So going from just your basic, say, three sets of eight to 15, which uh, is what a lot of linear periodization models employ, there might at this stage be a variety of stimulus. You may start to work the top end of strength work and the bottom end of hypertrophy work a lot more. So we might start to see the introduction of very low rep sets, even for a bodybuilder. It might be something which is viable. Like you may start to do singles, doubles, triples, that kind of stuff, which is not typically hypertrophy work. You may start to do things in a very high end, like reps in the 20 to 30 range, burnout stuff, you know? So the variety of stimulus can be increased to hit different areas of the body to ensure that strength and mass keeps increasing. So I'll give you an example from my tactician program. In my tactician program, it's generally aimed at intermediates. I mean, it can be used by beginners as well. It's perfectly fine for that. Um, but it can be, it's generally aimed as intermediates because you have a variety of stimulus and a variety of exercises. You're encouraged to take deloads. You're encouraged to switch exercises around and have a variety of exercises. 
You're also encouraged to do over warm ups, so singles, as a regular part of your training. You're also encouraged to do a high rep range. Um, you're also encouraged to do speed work. So there's a wide variety in the tactician booklet, which is all designed to break you out of a strength rut that you may have been in if you were just doing a standard three by 10 type of routine. In the wizard, similar example there, you have low rep work, you have medium rep work, you have high rep work. It's a little bit more within the confines of a bodybuilding routine and as a result, you use deloads, but it has a high degree of variety there. And again, that's quite good for intermediates, also very suitable for beginners too. But um, it's quite useful for, for intermediates. It's good for beginners to keep from being stale. So that's an example of how I've employed them in the past. And me personally, I've done various things. Like I have done top end singles, have done speed work, I've done very high repetitions. I've done conjugate style work alongside, you know, block periodization and, and elsewhere. So that's what happens next. And that's kind of what you can expect if you stall out on any periodization. And on this note, I should say, if you stall out and you've identified it's not a problem with your sleep schedule, your food, all that kind of stuff. Now, just a sort of quick note. As a natural trainee, your biggest weapons are variety of training modality. So that is the type of training that you do. So whether it's um, singles, whether it's medium repetitions, whether it's high repetitions, where variety of exercises, so there's constant and frequent changing of exercises with the goal of plugging weaknesses, plugging gaps, and a variety of training intensities. Okay, So perhaps having light weeks, perhaps having medium weeks, perhaps having heavy weeks, these are all your biggest weapons as a natural trainee is the variety in stress. Because at this point, the variety, the, the variety you need to progress is going to be higher than what you were used to when you were doing linear periodization as a beginner. Things were very straightforward then. And I do seriously think this is where most guys stall out. They stall out. They're in the gym for years because they just refuse to look any further and they never get exposed to anything other than linear periodization, bodybuilder style stuff. And the problem is not only do you stall out, but it can lead to more injuries as well because well, if you're grinding your head against a wall for like years and years, you're much more likely to pick up injuries. You're far less likely to keep fresh and stay supple because you're just in that grindy part of the cycle for so long and you're not making any progress. You're just stalling. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's bad in both ways, really. You, it, it pays to look around. And at this stage, I just want to have a brief note on progenetics and drugs. One thing that you will see with both people with progenetics and also people who use drugs is consider them to be beginners for a large portion of their career. Okay. They don't need the training complexity. So they don't know about it. You'll see any number of pro athletes whose only um, information about bodybuilding is do this routine, even though they might really hype it up. They go, yeah, like you got to do the pull down at this angle. So you got to, you know, but absolutely nothing in the way of periodization. None of the bigger top-down concepts at all. Just like minutiae about, yeah, I turn my pinky up this way or that way when I'm doing curls. Like, who gives a crap, dude? Like, it doesn't, that doesn't make any meaningful difference in terms of the overall systematic recovery and how your gains. They're speaking like that simply because they are highly genetically advanced. So they've never had to delve into more complicated methods. Remember I told you about my nanticular bench, like I had to look for ways around that to eventually surpass those numbers because I just hit a stone wall. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue of my application of the diet the tr and the effort in the, in the gym. It was simply the training knowledge wasn't there. Now you imagine the stall that I hit at 90 kilos. Imagine a guy who never stalls until he hits like a 220 kilo incline bench because there are people out there like that. You know, now you add progenetics with drugs. You have guys, I actually saw on the um, Fuad Abiyad podcast a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago now, I forget when it was, but, um, and this is not a dig at him because I really like him. I think he's got some good material, but one of the guests on there, Ben Chow, uh, no, it wasn't Ben, it was um, Guy, one of, one of the guests on there, they were talking about um, Matt Jansen and his views on training. And they were like, yeah, Matt just stays with the same exercise for a long period of time and he gets stronger on that exercise. And that's how he has his trainees. And like at least two of the guys on a podcast flight. So basically he was describing, you know, progressive overload, right? And two of the bodybuilders, I, I think it was Guy and Fuad, were like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Stick with the same exercise and get stronger at it. What kind of madness is this? So it's like, imagine having that level of elite genetics where literally progressive overload is a foreign concept to you. Like you just don't even understand 
what how it must be to struggle for two and a half kilos on the bar every week like it would be great like i'm not i'm not having a dig like it would honestly be amazing imagine having those type of genetics that you just don't even have to worry about having any semblance of a decent routine but you know you talk about like hard work and like digging in <laughs> that kind of stuff <laughs> so yeah i mean my point with this is not to ridicule those guys because i do listen to podcasts and it's a fun podcast but my point is just that how much can you take from pro athletes who are genetic outliers and are on drugs because as we saw from this weekend's mr uh, the, the arnold classic on the pro stage right when it comes down to it everybody has access to the same drugs and they're all genetic elites the difference is the guy who applies himself with that little bit more um of a scientific method so he uses progressive overload uses the, the, the appropriate level of periodization for him you know what i'm talking i'm talking about nick walker nick walker Dorian Yates, you know, those guys used what still was a very basic form of linear periodization, but at least they used that. They didn't just turn up at the gym and do like stuff <laughs> and to get them to 250 pounds shredded. That's why Nick has been able to make such fast progress, I believe. And it's why Dorian was able to make such fast progress because he's actually taken a fairly scientific method to his training and he has genetics and he has drugs. Like you combine that and you have guys like Nick, who win pro shows uh, in their first pro season. So yeah, at the, at the pro level, everyone has those genetics. Everyone has those drugs. It's who can actually apply themselves in a reasonable manner. So when I hear guys talking about sort of progressive, progressive overload, I, it does warm my heart. I think that's great. But you don't see very many guys on the pro circuit talking about more complicated methods. So you think to yourself, like, how much can you take from these guys when it comes to training, even when it comes to diet? Because I'm um, Let's say, for example, you eat 2,000 calories or 3,000 calories, and some other guy with great genetics eats 3,000 calories. Who's going to gain more muscle? Who's going to have better partitioning? Well, and what has he done to accomplish that? Well, he's done nothing to accomplish that. It's just genetics. What about if you're on a fat loss diet and you, you're cutting weight with a 500 calorie deficit and he's cutting weight with a 500 calorie deficit? Well, due to his better partitioning, he will get better results than you. Did he work harder for those? Did he have a more intelligent approach? No. So it calls into question, how much can you actually learn from these pro genetics and guys who are on drugs? Like I would argue very little because everything they do, there's going to be the question mark of, is it getting better results because they have some sort of knowledge which you don't have? Or is it simply because their genetic potential is better, their food partitioning is better, their P ratio is better, they have better drugs? How do you know? How do you know? And they might, they might make a very convincing argument. Like, oh, yeah, this particular angle of pull down is really going to hit the lower lats. Maybe. But um, what might be more prudent to do is learn from people who don't have the best genetics, but who have and have had stalls. They have stalled. And those stalls are well documented. And they have broken past their stalls and perhaps doubled you know, their, their weights that they've used eventually. And it's the same with diet. Like, one of the reasons why I get such good rate results with my clients with regards to diet is I was a fat guy when I was younger. I was a fat guy most of my life until I really delved into bodybuilding and staying leaner. So I think when it comes to that, like who are we looking for to get results? And in the, con in the, con in the um, context of the discussion today with regards to linear periodization and more advanced stuff, you need to have experienced the more advanced stuff, I think, to really be able to teach it. Um, so... Just bear that in mind when you're looking at where to get information from as well. Right, guys, hopefully you found that interesting. Um, I will do more videos on different types of periodization at some point, but for now, hopefully that's giving you a primer into periodization basics.